All right, everyone, welcome back, and let's go ahead and move on to the next topic on the list, which is going to be the ear and hearing, or audition. So let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, so something to, a couple things to say before we really start hammering into uh, hearing and then vision after this. Uh, unlike what we've talked about so far with touch and taste and smell, the stimuli that we're about to talk about, in the case of vision, we're talking about photons of light, and with hearing, we're talking about vibrations in the air. These are unusual stimuli. I mean, you really have to kind of think and get creative to really kind of come up with a way to convert these types of stimuli into electrical signals that can be transmitted to the brain. And thankfully, throughout the course of evolution, that's exactly what has happened here. So what we're going to have here are specialized sensory organs that we're going to look at for both hearing and vision that are able to convert these stimuli into action potentials. But the idea is the same as always. Once the stimulus leads to a significant enough receptor or graded potential, the action potential is going to travel to the thalamus in typical fashion through a particular cranial nerve. If it's the uh, if it's hearing and equilibrium, it will be through the vestibular cochlear nerve, and if it's vision, it's going to be through the optic nerve. So most of our discussions for both hearing in this video and vision on the next video, most of our discussions are mainly going to focus on how these very unusual stimuli are converted into receptor potentials. And then we shouldn't really have to say too much about the action potentials because uh, we can almost take that for granted, right? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the ear. Now, typically for a physiology class, I like to keep anatomy to a bare minimum, but the unique architecture of the ear is so integral to how the physiology works in terms of giving an action potential, we kind of have to discuss it, right? Okay, so the ear can be split up into an outer ear, a middle ear, and an inner ear, right? So the outer ear, its function is pretty simple, right? It frames our head and then Physiologically speaking, it acts as kind of a sound wave funnel. It basically funnels sound waves into the uh, ear canal. So it's going to get the ball rolling towards getting those vibrating sound waves into the middle ear. So what separates the outer ear from the middle ear is your eardrum, as you know it. So the more uh, appropriate term is the tympanic membrane. So what happens here is going to kind of set the bar for what's going to happen at every step along the way here. So basically what gives a sound its pitch is the frequency of the vibrations moving through the air. So what we want to do here in order to accurately perceive what we're hearing in terms of the sound that we're hearing is we want to conserve that frequency. We want the frequency to always be the same at every step of the way. So what we're essentially going to do here is we're going to start basically playing a game of hot potato, except instead of a potato, it's going to be vibrations. So basically it's going to be one structure vibrating and then passing on its vibration to the next structure and then to the next structure and to the next structure. But all the while, we want the frequency of those vibrations to be the same at every single step. That way, the sound that we hear can actually be perceived the way that it actually is in reality. So the sound waves that are funneled into the tympanic membrane are going to strike the tympanic membrane and it is going to start oscillating at almost exactly the same uh, frequency as the sound. So on the other side of the tympanic membrane, so at this point the tympanic membrane is vibrating, uh, these are going to be our auditory ossicles. So three very, very, very small bony structures that are contained within the middle ear here. So uh, these... Uh, auditory ossicles are each connected to each other and then the third of the ossicles which is called the stapes is then attached to the first anterior part of the inner ear so basically what these auditory ossicles are going to do is receive the vibrations from the tympanic membrane and then pass them on to structures of the inner ear so what's essentially going to happen here is that the tympanic membrane vibrates at a certain frequency it passes its uh vibration onto the malleus and then it passes it on to the incus and then finally to the stapes. So these vibrations are transmitted through these bony structures and then because the stapes is connected to again the first structure of the inner ear called the oval window, a membranous structure of the inner ear called the oval window, 
that membrane is then going to start oscillating at the same frequency. So you really can see here how we're just kind of passing the frequency along here. So at this point, looking at the inner ear for hearing and audition, the part of the inner ear we're going to focus on is called the cochlea, this kind of snail-shaped structure that you see here. Uh, so most of the action in terms of signal transduction, taking those frequencies and actually turning it into an action potential, most of that action is going to happen here in the cochlea. All the outer and uh, middle ear really we're serving to do is to get those vibrations delivered to the cochlea. So the cochlea that you can see here is separated from the middle ear by the oval window, which is just laying on the other side of that uh, 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 stapes right there. So if we look at the cochlea here, we can see a couple of different cavities here. So in green here, this kind of light green, this lime green that you see here, are two continuous cavities that go all the way through the kind of winding uh, snail-like structure of the cochlea. Uh, right on the immediate side of the stapes is the scala vestibuli, and then if you kind of wind yourself all the way around, you'll eventually come to the scala tympani. Like I said, they're continuous with each other, but because they're kind of on opposite ends of the cochlea, we consider them to be kind of two different things. So the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani are located within what is sometimes called the bony labyrinth of the ear. So the cochlea is actually embedded within the temporal bone here of the cranium. So you can see all this bony structure around the cochlea here. So we tend to kind of think of this outer region that kind of forms the outermost barrier or uh, uh, structure of the vestibuli and the tympani, we call that the bony labyrinth because of its proximity to the temporal bone there. So contained within the vestibuli and the tympani is a type of extracellular fluid called perilymph. There's not anything particularly interesting about the perilymph in terms of its composition, but what's going to happen is once that oval window absorbs the vibrations from the stapes, it is then going to displace or move the perilymph and it's going to start uh, kind of rippling and moving from the scale of vestibuli so we're basically going to kind of cause a ripple effect here in which this perilymph kind of moves throughout the cochlea and then kind of shifts towards the tympani and that shifting that ripple effect is going to displace another membranous structure called the round window now these terms are a little bit confusing because I can't imagine coming up with two different terms that sound as similar as round window and oval window. So believe me, I'm sympathetic in terms of maybe it being a little bit hard to keep those two terms straight. But essentially what we're doing here is because the perilymph oscillates at the same vibration and, be and begins rippling, it places pressure on that round window there. And the round window is attached to a portion of this middlemost layer of the cochlea, which is kind of in a deeper blue greenish color there, that is called the scala media. So the scala media, which is contained within a structure called the membranous labyrinth, so you have the bony labyrinth here on the outside and then the membranous labyrinth here on the inside that separates the vestibuli and the tympani from the media. Now, the extracellular fluid in the scala media, which is where all the action is going to occur, this extracellular fluid is called endolymph as opposed to perilymph in the vestibuli and the tympani. Now, I said perilymph isn't particularly interesting in terms of its composition, but endolymph is. Endolymph is very unusual in that it has a very high concentration of potassium. Now, when you compare that to all the other types of extracellular fluid that we've talked about throughout the semester, why is that so unusual? Where do we usually find a lot of potassium? Yeah, we usually find most of our potassium in intracellular fluid. There's not usually a lot of potassium in the extracellular fluid. So let's talk about why this is going to be so interesting. Now, before we get to that, what I want you to notice here is that contained within the scala media, is these little red things here that look like they're kind of sticking up on pikes. These are called hair cells. So altogether, these little hair cells make up a major structure in the scala media called the organ of cordy. So this is our sensory organ that allows us to hear. 
So these little hair cells, which are uh, on top of this structure called the uh, basilar membrane, when the round window is displaced, it pulls and shifts that basilar membrane, and that's going to kind of shift those hair cells back and forth within the scala media. Now again, you'll notice these little hair cells have these little structures that are kind of sticking up. Well, what that's going to do is that shifting is going to cause those guys to kind of sway back and forth in the endolymph. So we'll get to that in just a minute. So let's focus on that endolymph itself and that it ha it's unusual and that it has a lot of potassium. So let's talk about why that's going to be important. So ordinarily, as we understand it, or as we understood it in the nervous system, or at least most parts of the nervous system, anytime we open a potassium channel, typically the result is going to be hyperpolarization of the target cell, right? Because of the low concentration of potassium in most extracellular fluids, this will cause an open potassium channel to cause potassium to leak out of the cell rather than enter the cell, so as a consequence, the inside becomes less and less positive and more and more negative. Well, let's look at endolymph here. Well, endolymph, because there's a lot of potassium in the extracellular fluid, the concentration gradient's going to be pointed the opposite direction. So when you open a potassium channel this time, potassium will enter the cell and cause depolarization. So. Uh, that will get a cell, like a hair cell, excited and will get us closer to transmitting an action potential through the vestibular cochlear nerve. So the reason why you want to remember the endolymph has a lot of potassium is because you kind of have to think here because we're going to see that when these hair cells get displaced within the endolymph, that is going to lead to the opening of potassium channels. And what you've been trained to do so far is to think that when a potassium channel opens, that means hyperpolarization. But in this particular case, because of the unique composition of this endolymph, you have to think of it the other way. You're going to get depolarization here. So if we kind of take a uh, recap here, very briefly, when you hear something, you are hearing the vibrations in the air. The outer ear funnels those vibrations at a particular frequency to the uh, eardrum here, the tympanic membrane, it starts vibrating at the same frequency and it passes those vibrations along the auditory ossicles. Uh, the ossicles cause a uh, compression of the uh, oval window. Those uh, vibrations are passed along through the perilymph of the tympani and the vestibuli until we get to the round window here. The round window is connected to the basilar membrane of the uh, organ of cordy within the uh, scala media and that is going to shift those hair cells with their little thingies stuck up uh, kind of pointed up uh, we'll give those thingies a more appropriate name here in a minute so that's going to kind of start shifting those back and forth within this high potassium endolymph here so now let's take a little bit of a closer look at the cochlea here so we can kind of see what's going on so as we said, when the round window is displaced by the vibrations of the perilymph and the tympani, this shifts around the basilar membrane, and on top of the basilar membrane is the organs of cordy, which is our sensory organs for hearing. So you can actually see one of these within a cross-section of the cochlea, so this inner uh, cavity here is the scala media, and then you've got the vestibuli here and the tympani down here. So there's perilymph in these two right here, and there's endolymph in here. Here's that basilar membrane that's getting shift ar shifted around by the compression on the oval window, or excuse me, the round window. And then also interestingly enough, if you look at the very base of these organs of cordy, you can see sensory neuron axons that actually form up and form the vestibular cochlear nerve. So if we can just find a way to get these hair cells depolarized, we are well on our way to getting action potentials sent towards the brain through the vestibular cochlear nerve, as you see it here. But we just have, we still have to figure out how we're going to do that. So as we said, the specialized sensory neurons within the organ of cordy are called hair cells, interestingly enough, and you'll see why here in a minute. So each hair cell contains an array of specialized cilia at their apical side called stereocilia. So this should kind of remind you of taste cells and olfactory cells because they had their sensory receptors located on the apical side within cilia, right? 
So if you look here at individual hair cells as we see them in this zoom up here, you can see these stereocilia that point upwards tw uh, away from the hair cell. So your basilar membrane is down here and they are actually attached to another membrane called the tectorial membrane. So when the basilar membrane is shifting back and forth, this is going to cause the hair cells to shift back and forth. And this is going to cause the stereocilia to kind of bend one way or another. Now, they can bend one of two ways. They can bend towards the tallest of the cilia called the kinocilium. So that would be this one right here and this one right here. Or they can bend away from it. Now, that concept's not as important in hearing as it is in equilibrium, but it's still something to consider here. So when movement occur, occur, excuse me, when movement occurs in the direction of the kinocilium, this is going to trigger the opening of mechanically gated potassium channels on the membrane of the hair cell. So again, this is why it's so very important for you to understand why endolymph is so important. Typically, in the past, if we were to open potassium channels, this would certainly lead to hyperpolarization. But because of the high concentration of potassium in the endolymph, this is instead going to lead to depolarization and should lead to an action potential going through these sensory nerve fibers and we get our audition information transmitted to the brain. So one last thing to mention here, and we kind of just gave a brief overview of audition. We certainly could make it more complicated if we wanted, but you've got a pretty good general idea of it by now. Uh, the last thing for us to kind of cover here is sound frequency ranges. So uh, we're capable, as humans, we're capable of detecting frequencies anywhere between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Anything less than 20 hertz, we, we can't hear it. And anything greater than 20,000 hertz, we can't hear that either. So a great example is a dog whistle. So dogs can hear dog whistles, and it's not just because it's named a dog whistle. So dog whistles produce frequencies, I believe, somewhere around 50,000 hertz. So that's way too high of a frequency for us to be able to hear, but dogs can hear it. So if you blow on a dog whistle, you're not going to hear anything, but your dog is going to be going nuts and m wondering why you're making such a damn racket, right? Okay, so... Since this is human physiology, let's talk about the frequencies we actually can hear. So it turns out that our ability to distinguish between different frequencies actually is because there are different regions within the winding snail-like structure of the cochlea that are specialized for one frequency or another. Basically specialized hair cells that specialize and only deal with one particular type of frequency. It just so happens that our highest frequency sounds are handled by the hair cells in the organ of Corti that are located closest to either the oval window or the round window. So basically the most uh, proximal part of the cochlea. And then the lower frequency sounds as you kind of wind your way all the way through the cochlea, once you get closer to the apex or most distal tip of the cochlea, that's where we deal with our lowest frequency sounds. Okay, so Another whole topic that we could spend maybe 20 minutes talking about, which for the sake of time we're not going to, is equilibrium and balance. So the ear is not just about hearing. So there is another structure within the inner ear that is situated much the same way as the cochlea that deals with afferent information headed towards the brain regarding our positioning in terms of equilibrium and balance. So this structure is called the vestibular apparatus. So the nice thing here is that you're not missing out on too terribly much from us not really discussing it because honestly, it's really going to operate very much the same way as the cochlea did for hearing. So the vestibular apparatus, which itself is made up of three different structures called the utricle, the saccule, and the semicircular canals, uh, these structures also contain hair cells. And essentially, when your body position changes, so if you kind of twist your head back and forth or nod your head up and down, that is going to shift uh, uh, extracellular fluids within these cavities. And that is, again, going to cause hair cells to kind of bend back and forth with their stereocilia. So that information will also be transmitted to the brain via the vestibular cochlear nerve. All right, so that is going to do it for our discussion on hearing. So one thing I should mention to you is that 
Uh, this video on hearing an audition and previous videos were recorded in the summer of 2020. What we have caught up to now is the point in the semester of the spring of 2020 in which I had to start recording videos because of the COVID-19 outbreak. So those videos were recorded in the spring of 2020, and that includes our next uh, discussion on the eye and vision. So what you may hear is you may hear me say things that are more appropriate for events that happened in April or May of 2020, and they may not apply to you. So uh, if you're not sure about anything, I encourage you to contact me. If I say something in one of these future videos that doesn't sound right, just contact me. It may have been something that I, I meant just for those spring of 2020 students. All right, so I hope you'll enjoy our next set of videos uh, on the eye and vision. It's a uh, favorite topic of mine because I actually studied the eye in graduate school. So I hope you'll look forward to it and I will see you next time.